next presentation is uh, on the ANSYS OptiSline, uh, which is a tool for robust design optimization in oil and gas industry. And it will be presented by uh, Rene. Uh, Rene is working with ANSYS Germany office uh, as a, a product specialist for OptiSline. He has more than eight years of experience uh, in robust design optimization. So uh, welcome, Rene, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Therefore, I want to share my screen and want to go to the presentation mode. And some short question. Can you see my presentation? Uh, yes, Rene, we can see. OK, thank All you. Right. Thank for the introduction and uh, welcome. For today's uh, presentation from my side, introduction to Ensoptisling. Therefore, uh, this short introduction, I want to over jump and I want to show you the agenda for today. I want to show you something about Optislang and the capabilities we have, and then uh, some special points about both integration, model calibration, sensitivity, and so on, to show you um, our capabilities at these topics, and all times some proof points and also some proof points related to oil and gas. And at the end, some short summary. We want to start with this introduction for NSS OptiSlang as a part of the NSS platform. And as you know, we are acquired um, 2019, and uh, since this time, NSS OptiSlang is part of the NSS platform, together with NSS Minerva, NSS Quanta, and NSS Cloud. And NSS OptiSlang is the tool for both integration and design optimization, short called PIDO. And therefore, we want to start with this point, and here you can see um, the top three challenges for product development today. That means uh, mostly if you think about some variation analysis, we, we have such a um, yeah, big number of input parameters we want to normally focus on, we want to um, uh, vary on. And um, also, the point is we want to check several variations, and all these things are normally a um, handful of work to define the parameter, um, yeah, change to the next step, uh, that means the variation step, and also expect all times the, um, uh, the responses. And it's also clear we want to um, checking more and more multi-physical workflows, and therefore to create such an workflow where multiple um, different physical domains and therefore solvers should be combined is a lot of manual work and normally uh, this is really time consuming and so all time slow the time to market. Or if you think about the improvement steps where we normally want to focusing on to um, yeah, optimize our, our device, our process, there we have a lot of challenges goals we want to minimize, but also a lot of requirements we want to fulfill. And um, it's also really uh, um, challenging not only to focusing on the optimization of maybe physical behavior, also such cost relevant economic behaviors should be a target as some optimization. And to combine these uh, things is also normally uh, really difficult and therefore to really to really be sure that uh, that all optimization potential was uh, was reached out. This is also really a challenge at um, uh, daily simulation work. And at the end, it's clear only finding some optimal design is nothing uh, due to the fact that we have some input scattering. And therefore also to know which input scattering influence at most my output scattering and to see uh, which scattering is more important, less important. This is also really the point. Also, if you think about electronics reliability or ADA to uh, uh, ADA's topic, therefore also um, this probability of failure is more and more important. And therefore, OptusLang can help. And why OptusLang with this frozen equation and design optimization can help? It's clear at the beginning of such a product development process, we have some initial idea, 
initial status, initial point, and uh, we want to define some all-in design space with many, many input parameter, no limitation. But then it's the question, should I go to the left hand side, maybe to, um, okay, not fulfill all constraints, or maybe all times having failed designs, or going the right way, then maybe only finding some local optima, but it's clear we want to find more and therefore maybe we want to go and must go straight forward to find really the global optima and some robust optima. And therefore, obviously, is this decision making process um, to really have a full overview of the design space to improve it and also to identify the, these um, whole optimization potentials and also um, checking the tolerances and all these things is really clear uh, should be reused should be recycled and therefore also this topic simulation democratization that means a reuse of a predefined workflow a reuse of all these results should be really um, effective to also shorten the um, um, product development time and therefore also obviously has such capabilities for this and which capabilities we um, can offer for this process integration and design optimization you can see here divided in several steps for process integration we have these capabilities we can offer that means obviously is a tool for um, yeah, as a platform for tools chaining and really important is that we are solver neutral. It means um, not only ANSYS tool can combine also non ANSYS tools or maybe own written tools. And it's clear if we create such a tool chain, um, we want to run it automatically, automatically overnight or weekend or over weeks um, to use this workflow and run automatically. But what I said before, um, also this reuse of previously created workflows is possible. That means if you think about non-simulation expert or only product expert, um, also these, these colleagues, maybe at other location, should use this workflow and therefore um, we can publish our workflows with some web application with or without Minerva and also our capabilities uh, for digital transformation is there. That means we are creating some ROMs, uh, maybe for a physical domain like mechanical or acoustic or electric. All um, this is possible. That means we can create these ROMs for different physical domains and or measurement data, production data. And on the other hand, it's clear if we created such an um, such a tool chain, we want to use this tool chain for reducing our complexity. That means our philosophy is going all in with no limitation for the number of input parameter and no limitation for the number of output parameter. And therefore, we want to show what are the most important, less important, unimportant parameter and we want to create our reduce all models and making um, making the next step this optimization more efficient if we only reduce um, and filter out unimportant parameter and then um, use our optimization algorithm. The best way is using optimization our ROMs. That means we have no real solver call to optimize, but it's also clear to continue after optimization and checking the tolerances, checking the uh, Sigma level design, maybe three Sigma or also six Sigma, or also um, such a topic like for ADAS or electronics reliability, calculating the probability of failure. And it's also really important um, wearing input parameter and corresponding responses are also a topic for calibration. That means if you want to make a best fit between measurement and simulation data, also there we have unique differentiators for this model calibration. And for all these, um, for all these or with all these capabilities, we can um, yeah, reach our targets to really shorten the time to market, improve this product performance and also quantify and eliminate, uh, eliminate the risk. And in which way we want to do this? 
it's clear at the beginning we have some initial status, initial design, um, and many, many questions. Yeah, okay, which inputs I can use? Yeah, normally it's clear geometry, loads, or material. And then also uh, it's really important we can also import external data like measurement or production data. And then to going on for improvement for uh, reduce or the model generation and also to find out um, something about the tolerances and in which way we uh, um, fulfill these these aims yeah, is that we really orchestrate and optimize the whole workflow combining ANSYS tools and also non ANSYS tools wearing the input parameter and extracting the output parameter. And this obviously magic, um, this I want to show you later on in this special topics, calibration, sensitivity, and so on. And then the impact is clear. Normally we want to have a look on this and focusing on the optimizations and we have some optimized design. But we have also possibility to uh, um, going on and using our ROMs for some what if studies. That means a fast pre-calculation and therefore we can reduce the development time for it and then optimize the product performance and also check the reliability. And the last two slides for this uh, option introduction is uh, a short yeah, technical deep dive for this process in equation. It means process in equation again, uh, we are some platform for solver neutral uh, tools chaining. And here it's really important and these tools non ends tools or also own written tools can be combined. But also if you think about um, some own written DOE method, own written optimizer, all these things can be easily um, integrated with some plugin. And then this render neutral tools chain can be used for some design optimization. And therefore design optimization means for us robust design optimization. It means starting with some calibration, some model calibration, and then use the calibrated um, material and or process for some design understanding with sensitivity analysis to find out what are the most important, less important, unimportant parameters in the system understanding about where are all times my fulfilled um, constraints where I have all times my optimal designs, maybe have several optimal islands and then going on with design improvement. The best way is using our meta models and optimization on this on these ROMs and therefore we can decrease dramatically the simulation time and at the end checking the quality that means running some tolerance or reliability analysis and end up this workflow with some really optimized robust design. And this was the last slide for this optus laying introduction. And therefore we want to start now with the more specific topic, both in the equation. And therefore we want to show you how and in which way we can connect it to tools. Um, if we think about Ansys tools, then maybe you're using Ansys workbench. And therefore we have one uh, philosophy using OptiSlang in Ansys Workbench, we have this philosophy wizards only. That means uh, creating some parameterized model, maybe static structural, okay. And then we have a wizard for then wizard optimization, but also wizards for robustness. And these um, yeah, wizards will drive you, will guide you through all the settings with a minimal user input. And at the end of all these results, we have such an optima, um, such a decision tree. And this decision tree shows you our recommendation, which DOE method you should use, which optimization algorithm is sufficient, or which robustness and reliability approaches you should use. And really important, um, using OptiSlang in that NSS workbench, we have a so-called signal processing module ability to working also with non scalar values. That means if you think about um, signals, force over displacement, stress over strain, and all this is also implemented 
and this is needed for uh, platform where you can, uh, which you can use it for CAA workflows and therefore um, also easily track and drop possibilities are there to create any yeah, workflow you want to have. And therefore a minimal user input also there is required and we have in the same results sensitivity, optimization and so on. And uh, really important, you can yeah, customize all these things. You can customize the processing and at the end, uh, like in OptiSlang uh, using in Workbench, we have the same decision trees which we guide you through our recommendations. And here's some proof points for this process in equation. Some proof points for electronics mobi uh, mobility, where um, EMotive, um, that means Mr. Brück, use OptiSlang in the whole development process. That means he wants to start with a pre optimization with MotorCut using OptiSlang, and then using the pre optimized design for um, yeah, a more advanced 3D calculation in Maxwell, but also for other physical domains like structural, like acoustic, like thermal, and then creating for all um, these physical domains some ROMs, reduced order models, exporting it as an FMU, and then using um, such, such a uh, system simulation tool to import all these ROMs from OptiSlang and make some system simulation. And therefore, a lot of Solver integration is needed. Workflow capabilities are there, and then um, using OptiSlang for the several steps of this product development process. Some other workflow I want to show you here. That means how OptiSlang, how Dynado and Ansys will work, will help you at such an hydraulic fracturing workflow. And therefore, it's clear um, you can see the workflow and at the beginning it's clear we want to read in some data inputs and data inputs really important for trial fracturing are mostly not simulation data also measurement data and therefore we want to collect all these data external data from excel python whatever and we want to and can read in all this data and then uh, at the other hand, we want to create some 3D and can create some 3D parametric model with different solver you want to use. And then at uh, the beginning of this robust design optimization flow, we want to calibrate these things. It means we read in this external data, we have our simulation model, and then we want to make a best fit between these two things. It means calibration between the simulation and um, measurement data. And then we want to go on with this calibrated process or material for some variation analysis. That means we want to scan the whole design space. That means we want to create our meta model and we want to yeah, forecast and we want to predict uh, some yeah, important values you want to focusing on. But then it's also clear we want to forecast and we want to use these things for some um, understanding about the ranking, most important, less important, unimportant, and then continue and finishing with some optimization. And uh, for several um, of these steps for um, optimization, but also for um, uh, forecasting later on, I want to show you some proof points in the specific topics. And therefore, we want to continue with this next topic, model calibration. What does model calibration means for us? Uh, it means we have some so-called signal processing module where we can read in external data and also our simulation data are shown and we want to make a best fit between maybe curves, uh, more or many curves uh, or uh, one or uh, more than one curve are possible. And it's really important. We not only want to make a best fit. This is really easy. We want to increase the design understanding and therefore with help uh, of OptiSlang, we can identify which input parameter is important at which 
length of the signal abscissa. It means maybe you know, like an uh, elastic plastic behavior at the beginning, the yield stress is, is important, then the, um, sorry, the Young's modulus is important, then the yield stress is important, and then at the end, maybe some damage um, material parameter are important. And so with OptiSlang, we can um, visualize in which way or at which position, which input parameter is, um, is important. And then we want to make a best fit between these uh, measurement data. And some proof point here, you can see a calibration, a model calibration uh, done from Infineon, where we are focusing on the um, material calibration using seven unknown parameter. Mostly at Infineon, it was done uh, in a manually work. Many work over three weeks, really time consuming, and I would say not a perfect fit. And then it was done um, a calibration using OptiSling for the spy material. And you can see after only two days, the fit between simulation refer reference curve is really perfect. And this should show you um, our capabilities to shorten development time but with a really, really perfect um, result. That means having a really good fit between these two curves. This is one of our examples for calibration. Also, other um, proof points we have available. The next topic is this sensitivity analysis, where um, yeah, we st yeah, start at all times and then our philosophy, I said before, is going all in, defining for all the input parameter, the lower upper, uh, lower upper boundary. But then it's clear, we do not know exactly in which way we want to go. It means where are all times fail designs, where I have all times problems with um, non-convergence, or um, where's my really global optimal design. And therefore, we are creating some DOE methods, really efficient DOE methods, and then we are um, executing the solver. And then we are expecting all the responses, and we are creating our meta model, our meta model of optimal prognosis, which shows you in some easy way to have some linear behavior between inputs and outputs, to have some strong nonlinear behavior, or also where can I expect my optimal design cost minimum? And I can see a ranking of most important, less important, and maybe nearly unimportant input parameter. And all unimportant parameter will be filtered out automatically. And therefore, we can really, yeah, um, reduce the fog, minimize the fog, and clear the view, and increasing the design understanding of all my system. And therefore, the next slide should show you um, our adaptive meta modeling approach. That means we are creating these ROMs, but creating these ROMs means also we should make it efficient, not with a simple uniform distribution with a homogeneous density. No, uh, with OptiSlang, we are starting a uh, DOE sampling method, which is called adaptive mob. Therefore, we are creating Can you shortly repeat it? Uh, Rene, we lost for a couple of seconds. Um, you, you said you lost some last seconds, you mean? Yeah, your voice was not coming, so it, so we lost like a few seconds only in this slide only. Okay, okay, thanks. Uh, okay, then I will shortly repeat it. Um, that means going back to the presentation and it means we are creating our, our DOE method, our initial DOE, and then 
we are creating our regression models, um, sometimes neural network, sometimes movie square or other things. And then uh, we are using our objective measurement, um, measurement value, COP, which gives us some, some identificator what regression model wins. But it's then also clear we want to, uh, yeah, following our criteria. And here we can see at the next step, these adaptive meta modeling techniques are only adding design points in regions of interest. And maybe if you think about such a high gradient, then it's clear adding design points here in this red area will be nonsense because I want to identify if this is some outlier or is this some new physical behavior which I want to focus on. And therefore, this adaptive meta modeling technique are only adding design points in region of interest. And then this is really some efficient way where we can reduce the simulation effort. And out of this uh, adaptive mob, it's the same like before, we are creating such a ranking of most important, less important and unimportant parameter. And uh, what I said before, this coefficient of prognosis, the COP is really our objective measurement uh, value, which gives us an information about which meta modeling is the best. And a really also unique differentiator beside of this adaptive mob is that we can expand this MOP from a scalar value also for 3D fields. It means we can creating some mob for scalar values like a stress, like a cost, like efficiency. But if you think about a signal, maybe temperature over time, pressure over a length or whatever, we can create also such a signal MOP like I showed you in the calibration topic to show at which position, which input parameter is important. But then we can also expand it on field data if you think about a temperature distribution on a surface or a stress distribution on a surface or maybe a picture. Also a picture is nothing more like XY data or also measurement data. And also for this um, field data, for this 2D field data, we can create our, our um, MOP. And also for 3D data, it means XYZ a volume maybe, therefore we can create our field data, uh, sorry, our, our MOP. And um, yeah, proof points are available to show you several things. And here are some proof points for the scalar MOP. Um, Volkswagen was interesting about design understanding of their um, riveting process. And normally the state of the art um, state of the art process is yes using experimental data really time consuming really cost expensive okay and therefore sometimes they want to simulate simulate these things that means also here we would say okay the simulation time um, is also quite high okay maybe not so cost intensive and then we start and you can see it here it was shown in 2018 on our conference to really combine, combine measurement and simulation data and using our MOP technique to create such an um, MOP of this riveting process. And it's clear for this for such a riveting process, we want to have a look on this uh, to this art, uh, undercut. And this MOP gives you information about the undercut and also uh, the two most important inputs. And so having this MOP created between measurement and simulation data, we can use this MOP for some optimization, but this was not so important for this topic here. So I use this MOP for some what if studies. That means fast pre-calculations in seconds. Normally, if you want to vary the input parameter, then you need to run new measurement new simulation this needs hours or days but having created such an mop we to get in seconds sorry 
to get in seconds information about the responses. And so um, you can sh really shorten this um, development time. Some other example um, for this prediction for this MOP is some collaboration with, with Shell, where uh, we make a, a prediction, some MOP of the reservoir. And therefore, um, it was really um, some yeah, increasing process, on increasing process is wrong. Uh, this process really increased their knowledge about most important, less important, unimportant parameter. And then it was very easy, easy for them to increase, you can see here, uh, increasing the productive um, barrels uh, by two uh, by 1.65 million only using our MOP, and therefore this shows the potential using our MOP to increase, improve the responses. Some other example for optimization. I will show you also for oil and gas, but, but at the beginning, uh, at first also such a uh, deep dive what optimization means for us. That means we have such a scanned design space. We have some pre-optimized design. And then it's clear we want to minimize something. We want to find a global optima. And therefore it's clear having such an MOP, I can see directly, okay, the optimal design should be there. That means it's really efficient if we make, can make some optimization on MOP. And therefore, no resolver call will execute it. And this will shorten development time. If such an optimization on MOP is not possible, then we want and can go on with direct optimization algorithms. And therefore, we have gradient-based methods, nature-inspired methods, many algorithms. And it's also clear if you think about your really daily envir uh, environment and optimization um, focusing, then you have mostly such a Pareto optimization. Uh, that means cost and efficiency and so on. And therefore, um, also Pareto optimization can be done in OptiSlang. The first example will be a mechanical example. And then again, some example for oil and gas. Here we have some pre-optimized design from Fraunhofer using Workbench uh, with several load cases. And you can see this pre-optimized design was good, pre-optimized from the engineers uh, at the Fraunhofer without OptiSlang and yeah, was nice. And then we, uh, we get this initial design and we should show if we can uh, optimize uh, something more about the mass or the formation. At the first step, we all times make such a sensitivity analysis to identify most important, less important, unimportant parameter. And so then we can continue with optimization and focusing only on the uh, important parameter. And you can see here the optimized design compared with the pre-optimized design from IFA uh, or from, from Fraunhofer, sorry. Um, you can see there is some, some good improvement possible. And this shows you, this, this will show you that also using OptiSlang for pre-optimized design can show you the potential what is inside. And it's clear this pre-optimized design or this optimized design, sorry, can be then checked if it's really robust. Some other example um, you can see here, we have some optimized um, uh, optimized um, topic here, optimization topic for oil and gas, where we have several goals. And the several goals, it's clear, we want to increase the production and we also want to decrease the cost. It means a really compromise must be found. And it means um, Pareto optimization is needed. And if you do not know exactly the Pareto design, the Pareto front, optimization is nonsense. And normally um, it's really hard to find such a Pareto optimization. With OptiSlang it's possible. And if we now focusing on the initial and optimized design, we want to go on and you can see here the current design and normally, yes, it is also be nice to set, okay, for the same production, I can lower the cost. This is nice, but it's clear 
for such a Pareto optimization, I want to go in this direction. Yeah? This direction is the best way. Yeah? And therefore, also, this is possible. That means really increase the production and lower the costs in one combined way. And therefore, some um, optimization on such a Pareto front is possible in Optislang, but before the Pareto front must be, uh, must be identified. And therefore, you can also define uh, different baselines. It means different constraints, maybe. Yeah? And so these constraints uh, will maybe uh, um, lead this Pareto optimization later on on such a single optimization. And so different um, steps, yeah, different uh, optimal design or compromise are possible. And therefore, we are ready for this um, optimization point. Now we want to go on with this topic, robustness evaluation. Robustness evaluation um, is also really important. And therefore, yeah, again, robustness means we are creating some DOE method. And then we want to extract and can extract the responses. But it's clear for a Sigma level design, maybe three or six sigma, or for such a topic like probability of failure, you must define such a limit. And then you can calculate the sigma level or you can calculate the probability of failure. But also really important using OptiSlang for this robustness evaluation is the same benefit out of the sensitivity is if you're using OptiSlang for robustness evaluation, you will get such an MOP, you will get such an ranking about what are the most important input scattering, less important input scattering, and nearly unimportant scattering. And here, some example also from opinion from the semiconductor industry, where we want to focus on the um, solder joint reliability. You can see several um, presentations are done also and also this year on our worst conference in in june um, this topic will be continue and here it was a topic um, uh, for such an radar component and they identify which load is the most critical load in content of this reliability for solder joints and therefore uh, they want to identify which design is the most reliable and therefore they're checking several designs and normally for this reliability approaches, they're using a Monte Carlo method. But Monte Carlo method is really nonsense, really time consuming to put one million design points there. And therefore, we said, no, please follow our recommendations using our adaptive sampling methods. And also with this, our, uh, with this adaptive sampling methods, methods, we can prove such a low probability of failure. And this is possible because we are only focusing on the region of interest. And the region of interest for reliability is the region of failure. And also if you have multiple failure regions, this is possible with our adaptive sampling methods. And using OptiSlang, you can see we can reduce dramatically the number of sampling points. Only 10,000 is needed for this calculation for this solder joint reliability. And this is a topic for electronics reliability. But it's also clear for ADAS, where also reliability is, key, uh, is the key. Uh, therefore, OptiSlang is used not only from Daimler, also from Bosch and ZF. We have many um, presentations. And here you can see one presentation where we focusing on this gem end. It means uh, for this gem end, scenario we having several parameters certain parameters and using this yeah stupid monte carlo method you can see okay a lot of simulation are needed also with a short runner you must invest a lot of time to calculate but using OptiSlang, we can reduce dramatically the calculation time because yes we are starting again with some initial design initial DOE, and then we creating our regression models. We know something about 
um, the, the failure regions, and we can also identify with our several approaches, uh, also multiple failure regions, and then we are only concentrating on these failure regions, on this region of interest, and then we can calculate also low um, probability of failure with a low number of sampling points compared um, to Monte Carlo, we can really reduce the um, development time. And now, nearly the last topic, uh, content will be now OptiSlang for material and process data management. Here, I want to also show you then such an example for oil and gas. Why is this important? Um, because it's clear. OptiSlang is also a tool for measurement and production data because measurement and production data are nothing more like wearing input parameter and corresponding responses. And therefore, some example from, um, from Jena, Jena company for laser, uh, laser ablation of technical ceramics, where we should create the DOE, not a stupid worst case, not a stupid full factorial, no, they are using our um, really nice DOE methods. They are running um, the experiments and then we are extracting uh, the responses, checking the yeah, statistical data, really, really simple, but then giving uh, some information about the ranking, the main process parameter, most important, less important, unimportant, and then this was used to optimize the process parameter because they want to uh, um, uh, optimize also this laser ablation um, process. And therefore, um, here it was the, the point DOE generation, identification of the process parameter, and then really optimize the, um, the process parameter. And then also, okay, comparison with measurement uh, was here done. Some other example from the oil and gas industry is here you can see external data, 130 measurement data importing from, um, from Excel, but also from, from uh, Python. And then this is normally really important. Um, and this was here the challenge. A lot of input correlation are happen and uh, this input correlation can be easily automatically removed. And then we are creating our MOP, our ROM, and therefore we can identify again most important, less important, unimportant parameter. And here they do not want to use this MOP to make some what if study. Here they are using this MOP again for optimization of the process parameter to maximize um, whatever each response they want to focusing on. And here's a nice example of what I said before. Um, using also external data, but now they are using a field, some picture, X and Y. And also for this field, we are can creating some field MOP, some 2D field MOP. And here it was done for a thousand designs. It means for thousand pictures. And for uh, these thousand designs, we have five images. It means uh, five responses per design. That means it was a simple matrix of 30 multiplied with 40. And using this field MOP is the benefit or the benefit for using this field MOP is then that we can show at which position, which input parameter have some influence. And this is also really important for predictive maintenance because we can show spatial correlated responses. We can show spatial correlations and to set something about if you want to, to um, make a positioning of sensors, maybe redundant sensors or other things. Really with this topic, with this 2D field or also 3D field um, topics, we can, um, we can really increase the design understanding and also uh, one and increase this topic predictive maintenance. And this last topic before we we want to focusing on this uh, summary is simulation democratization. It's clear simulation democratization is um, yeah combined with more uh, most times with this persuasive simulation environment. It means 
yeah, many tools they use. Uh, you're using um, complex at once uh, tools chains um, for multi-physic workflows. And the idea behind the simulation democratization is all times one to many. That means um, a predefined workflow, predefined or pre-created um, resource should be reused for many concept engineers, product expert also at other locations. And what is the, the benefit? Um, we have done some survey from automotive, um, automotive customers where we ask them what is the benefit if you focusing on simulation democratization and it's clear these two topics here reduce development cost and reduce development time is the most important topic but also this collaboration that means this increasing collaboration between um, other locations of CAE concept engineers and uh, CAE simulation engineers is important, but also to uh, yeah, um, yeah, quantify the risk and minimize the risk. And uh, what capabilities OptiSlang can offer is that we have such a so-called OptiSlang web app. And this OptiSlang web app gives you a really simple possibility to publish workflows. This is shown here but also publish the MOP, that means publish the results. And therefore, you have some previously created workflow. And with a simple web app, you can create such a an GUI. And this GUI gives you ex access on only some settings. Not on all settings, maybe only the low upper bound. Maybe the goals you want to change and maybe the number of designs you want to run in parallel. And so also other simulation engineers or also other product expert at other location can have access to one such a really complex workflow uh, directly without knowing something about OptiSlang, something about the solvers. And it's also possible um, to publish our results. That means they can run also easily some what if studies on our MOP. And the benefit is that this web application, which is available in OptiSlang, is really uh, ready to use. It means there's no license or extra cost needed. We have, um, there's no installation needed. It means we have some one click solution to start such a web app. And normally for me, um, um, having such a predefined workflow, and putting it on the web service is only 20, uh, 20 minutes needed. That means really the implementation time is also very low. And this means yeah, we have such a really nice front end for publishing workflows or publishing results. Then this wizards or this, this GUI gives you access to um, some settings and then a really advanced workflow can be executed automatically without knowing something about with ANSYS or non ansys tools. And this can be then also combined with a database where we can receive and send something back. And what I've shown here, yeah, what I said before, this MOP is normally our result. And if you have some, um, some database with such a result for several motors, several datas, then also what if studies can be done in seconds. And therefore now um, the last slide for this summary about OptiSlang. And here um, I want to focusing on the first summary point, this openness and web application. That means what we said before, we are vendor neutral to create any advanced tool chain you want to, to, uh, to use. And also to uh, um, gives you possibility to publish this workflow on a web app connected to a database. And customization is possible at all levels. That means if you want to customize the process in the, uh, the, the processing, it's possible. If you want to customize the DOE optimization algorithms, it's all possible. Some other really unique differentiator is this topic sensitivity analysis. It means here we have really unique differentiators. What I shown, what I have shown, this adaptive meta modeling technique, 
where we only focusing on the region of interest. And so we can really um, yeah, create the sampling method really efficient. And we have a lot of um, regression models, also deep learning regression models, which go into competition um, for the best regression model, for the meta model of optimal prognosis. And we can use and create meta models also for sickness or field data. And we have a really nice interactive processing, which shows you at one glance, what is the benefit out of sensitivity, out of optimization or out of reliability. And therefore showing you the last um, different um, unit differentiator, this robustness and reliability, where we also can read in external measurement or production data, and we can build up these, um, this histogram with uh, our multi-uniform uh, distribution types. And also we can run automatically a so-called nested system where we check all optimal design directly in regards of the robustness. And then you come really out automatically out of this nested system with an optimal robust design. And we have uh, cutting edge reliability approaches, which gives you the possibility in topics like ADAS or in topics like electronics reliability um, to really shorten the development time and not using Monte, Monte Carlo methods. And therefore the, the aim is, uh, or the, the, the yeah, the, the key is that we only focusing on region of interest, also multiple failure regions are possible and um, yeah, it's all ready to use. And therefore, I'm finished with this introduction about OptiSlang and uh, some proof points and also some proof points for oil and gas industry. And if you have questions, I'm ready to start. Can I ask a quick, quick question, Ajay? Uh, Rene, thank you very much for the detailed description. Uh, I'm just curious about your uh, experience with using deep learning as optimiz for optimization. I mean, how does it compare with the classical optimization techniques? Um, maybe we must um, uh, precise it. That means this deep learning is only a method for meta modeling techniques. That means um, here we have um, in the past, we having polynomial regression, we having moving the square and creaking. And uh, several years ago, I think two years ago, we decided, okay, also deep learning, that means neural networks should be implemented. But these deep learning algorithms are only there for having an other regression model to creating our MOP. Understood. So, I mean, uh, I'm specifically a, a, a curious uh, classical uh, reduced order model like creating based and yep. deep learning. So, uh, did a deep so because in conferences, many people are using deep learning as a reduced order model. And when we ask okay. them what's the difference between yep. reduced order model and deep learning, so they say, well, they have some. Uh, element of uh, getting us a surprisingly good result ah, okay. or they, yeah. they can mm -hmm. extrapolate also again uh, mm -hmm. i just i was just curious to see if, if you have mm -hmm. some some comments uh, and here yes we have some comment um, it's not shown here but we have made some nice presentation 2019 from our method guy uh, method uh, person thomas most uh, because you know this deep learning this neural networks are normally um, developed for this topic big data yeah. And big data means that you have maybe um, uh, 500,000 or 10,000 data, data of measurement or data of simulations. And normally we decided years ago that, okay, simulations, thousand simulations are not possible. And therefore uh, we are decided years ago that deep learning, uh, deep learning is not a topic for us, but now with uh, better computer techniques, with um, having also short runners or also uh, bigger measurement data, we decided to put in deep learning, um, deep learning approaches. And the key is in OptiSlang set, not all times deep learning is, is the winner. Therefore, we have really our um, objective measurement, uh, measurement value, which is called uh, CUP, which decided, okay, sometimes the deep learning is winning the competition and sometimes moving least square or polynomial regression is, is, uh, is the winner, is needed, it's enough. 
and uh, I can send you some presentation where you make such a benchmark um, using our MOP technique where the D, uh, DLE, so it means deep learning extension is implemented and using it for measurement data where we have 6000 measurement data, but also using it on the other hand for a CFD simulation with only 176 design points simulated. And we have also other, uh, other benchmarks and this benchmark I can share with you shows you for this measurement data having more than 500 1000 design points. This neural networks is. Only much faster, only faster to create, but not better. Because moving, um, moving square and quick needs hours if we have more than 1000 design points and therefore um, deep learning extension is needed. It's better, but having uh, and focusing on the CFD topic where we have only 176 design points there. Deep learning extension completely loose. Let's say loose because of. Not finding the real. Outlier and it's also clear focusing on CFD LS diners. You have some solver noise. You have some outlier. You have some singularities and for this topic, this deal he was losing the competition and some other regression model wins and therefore it's nice to have it in but not all times it wins the competition and therefore we think really you need to have some objective measurement data otherwise how you can identify if this deep learning extension was the best one and this we can offer and i can send you such, uh, this presentation fantastic thank you very much for the detailed response thank you yep All right, so moving to our last presentation uh, for today, and uh, that is on ANSYS Granta, which is our material intelligence tool, and the presentation will be done by Maria. So Maria is uh, working with the Fluid Codes as an application engineer, and uh, she is taking care of any ANSYS Granta related activities in this Middle East region. So Maria, floor is yours. Uh, go ahead. Thank you, Jay. Are you able to hear me well? Uh, yes, very clear and uh, I can see your slide also. OK, perfect. Um, hello, everyone, and uh, thank you. Thank you for attending today's event and this session. Um, I will present to you today the ANSYS Granta material solutions and how they can help you uh, make the best material choices. I would like to first start with why is materials information important and why should we care about it? So the business criticality of materials information can be split in three main areas that you see here, and those are controlling cost, boosting revenue and mitigating risk. And uh, engineers ask themselves uh, questions in these areas such as uh, can I perform reliable simulation? Can I trust my results? Uh, and if uh, I manufacture globally, what is an equivalent grade that I can use to, to achieve a consistency between my products manufactured in these different sites? Could I make this product at a lower cost? And uh, many other questions that are revolving around the cost topic. The next me, uh, main issue is uh, revenue and um, in terms of product development, it is um, very often it is not just about the design. You need to innovate through new materials, you need to lightweight, you need to consider the environmental impact of your products. And uh, finally, we go to uh, mitigating the risk and uh, questions such as is my material strong enough? Do I have statistically validated design data for the particular conditions that my product will undergo? And uh, does my product contain restricted substances today or maybe in some two or three years time? Uh, one of these uh, chemicals that I'm using may become restricted in certain regions. All of these questions engineers ask themselves on a daily basis and um, they are 
business critical. Understanding this, uh, ANSYS has made the materials information a foundation for uh, their product portfolio, covering all the different solvers and all the different physics. Inside uh, this materials information is feeding data to, to every simulation. And when we think of materials information, uh, we think of ANSYS Granta. The main, um, the main solutions that Granta provides are uh, the first one is data, and uh, this is uh, a huge amount of um, material libraries and data that is reliable and validated. The second thing is software that can help you operate on this data and manage your materials information. Then uh, there are special services for these customers that required um, a tailored solution to their specific use cases and uh, a strong net of collaborations in industry research and uh, academia. ANSYS Granta was created in the, uh, actually Granta was created in the University of Cambridge, but um, it, since this day, it has very, very strong relations with the industry and uh, the development of this product and uh, its improvement every day is uh, dictated by the industry's needs. This is why it covers uh, trending topics, topics such as additive manufacturing, uh, ICEM, which is Integrated Computational Material Engineering, and uh, many more. In terms of the particular solutions that uh, ANSYS Granta provides, we start with uh, the materials data for simulation. As the name suggests, this is a product which gives you access to ready-to-use simulation data directly into um, every engineer's work environment inside ANSYS. Then there is uh, the tool Grant Selector that enables uh, you to make smart engineering choices. And uh, to make these smart choices and to have uh, brilliant engineers, we need to start preparing them in their educational studies. And uh, here comes to help Granta EduPack. And finally, to get uh, the materials intelligence to its full potential, there is the Granta MI Enterprise software, which is an enterprise-wide uh, materials management system. Uh, sorry. Starting with uh, this uh, entry level product, which is materials data for simulation. It is aimed at uh, simulation engineers and uh, these people face every day different engineering challenges that are related to, to materials. The main three ones would be um, that mistakes are made because different materials names are used between different uh, departments and different teams. The second thing is that uh, inaccurate materials data leads to poor simulation accuracy. And uh, also very often the simulation engineers struggle to find uh, the materials information they need and uh, they waste a lot of time searching for this data. They may turn to external sources such as suppliers where the, the information they get may be biased or they can look uh, on the internet where the information can be unreliable. And uh, even if after uh, some time searching, they manage to find, uh, let's say, accurate data, they would still uh, need to do some manual inputting and formatting this data to get it ready and use it into their simulation. And the solution of Granta MDS to, to remedy these challenges is uh, providing accurate materials data, which leads to fewer repeat simulations. 
Um, the MDS is a simple bolt-on tool that is incorporated directly into uh, different ANSYS uh, solvers uh, in 3D design, fluids, uh, electronics and structures. And as you see on this video, this is the, um, the integration inside uh, ANSYS Workbench Mechanical. It is very easy here to search for materials, uh, browse uh, in the library, and also you can filter certain materials, certain material models and uh, their properties. Uh, since uh, engineers have this tool at their fingertips inside uh, their work environment, they don't waste time searching for materials data and therefore they can focus on what is important, which is their simulation. And this leads to higher engineering productivity. So grant uh, uh, MDS, its key capabilities are that it provides an easy access to materials data that is trusted, simulation ready and uh, covers different multi-physics. The second product is Grant a Selector. It helps you make smarter material choices and it is aimed at materials engineers, product designers and simulation analysts. Uh, these people ask themselves um, if am I using the, uh, the best material for my application because a wrong material choice can lead to added design cycles and uh, the spend on raw materials uh, is a huge expense so they are struggling to, to reduce cost. Uh, maybe they are asking themselves if they are using the right suppliers or the right materials. And uh, finally, there is uh, a risk of product failure from poor material selection. And here product failure, it can be in service of the product, but it can also be uh, during the development stage that it turns out that uh, the material is not competitive enough to make it uh, on the market. And what uh, Grant a Selector can offer here is reducing the design rework related to material selection by up to three times, reducing the material costs by uh, up to 6% and uh, increasing in product lifetime by up to six times. Here you can see a glimpse of the user interface of the software and uh, what is it about? What is this software exactly? In the center, there is this uh, huge encyclopedia of materials data. Uh, it contains generic grades. It contains uh, specific producer grades, um, standards and specifications and so on. And uh, in some of these libraries, there are uh, hundreds of thousands of records and also in here you can find not just technical properties but also others that are not so easily available such as uh, cost, producer, sourcing, environmental impact of materials so that when you are considering a, a material you can um, review the all of the different angles of its performance. But uh, this software is uh, much more than just uh, data. What makes it uh, unique is the powerful visualization, filtering, solving and estimation tools that are incorporated inside. You can uh, very quickly apply limit stages, create charts like the one you see here. Uh, you can explore different trade-offs and uh, uh, maybe what is uh, a very important, it helps not only you to find the best material, but also to, um, to communicate your choice in a very convincing way to the stakeholders. You can generate a report with uh, a single click here. 
Also, this materials information uh, does not stop here. It needs to be used in uh, design and in simulation. So there are different exporters to ANSYS products as well as to other tools, uh, other software that is not ANSYS. There is a find similar tool which uh, allows you to find uh, alternative materials with a single click and they are analytical tools. The first one is the synthesizer tools, which uh, lets you explore the, the properties and of uh, hybrid materials and structures, such as composites, honeycombs, laminates, sandwich panels, and compare their performance to, to standard materials from the library. Uh, then from 2021, we have also the battery designer tool where you can explore different battery configurations. There is the eco audit tool to help you make an assessment of the environmental impact of your product and uh, to see where you can make the big savings. And uh, there is also a part cost estimator which allows you even in the early stages of design to, to see how your choice of material and production processes affect the final cost of your product. And uh, we also provide a seamless integration with uh, ANSYS Workbench so that it is uh, convenient to our users. With uh, all of these tools and data, the core benefits that the Granta Selector can bring are innovation through materials. You can now consider materials that you, you haven't considered before. Quickly resolve material issues. This can be related to supply chain issues or um, identifying um, uh, or some in-house initiatives uh, such as reducing cost, for example, or light weighting then you can confirm and validate your choice of materials and uh, defend this choice to the stakeholders. And finally, reduce the cost of materials, research, design and simulation. So a lot of benefits here from this tool and um, it is uh, very important to, to know the basics of this uh, material selection process. And this is where Granta EduPack comes in to enhance the teaching of materials. This software is used on uh, six continents in uh, more than 1400 educational institutions around the world. And uh, it comes with uh, more than just software. They are also teaching and learning resources that are developed specifically for undergraduate materials related education across engineering, design and science. And these uh, resources can be uh, presentations, case studies, papers, exercises, tutorials, videos. Uh, they come in different format, in different, uh, you can sort them in, by their language, their type, uh, package and it saves a lot of time for lecture preparation. Grant EduPack is uh, also divided into different levels so that it is suited for all of the years of educational studies. And it also covers many different uh, areas such as bioengineering, industrial design, civil engineering and architecture, uh, material and polymer science, sustainability, and uh, more. And uh, I would quickly like to show you here the, the core functionality uh, of Grant uh, EduPack, that is to introduce students to rational material selection through real world mechanical engineering uh, examples. And this example here is a small project for a material selection for an airplane wing. On the right hand side, you can see the different requirements and uh, very often students uh, struggle to differentiate between the stiffness and strength of the material. And these two have to be considered separately because they impact different aspects of the 
performance of the airplane wing. So what uh, we can do to help students understand this difference um, is uh, to, to make them understand the performance of, of the different material families and the different properties. You can see here uh, a chart which has the yield strength on one axis and the Young's modulus on the other. And uh, this can help students understand why, for example, aluminum alloys and composites are preferred for such applications, uh, for example, in the aerospace. And uh, also after the students apply the other requirements that were shown on the previous slide, they will get a short list of materials that uh, would be suitable for this application. Uh, and uh, then they can create such trade-off between price and density and understand why aluminum alloys are preferred uh, choice for this um, airplane wing. They can look through this material record and indeed uh, you see the application here that it is used in the, uh, for aircraft production. And also they can uh, continue their uh, studies by self-learning and exploring the different properties and uh, uh, with uh, the provided science notes inside the software. This one here is uh, on the Young's modules. This example is uh, made in a very introductory database and this is why you see just a very general aluminum alloys for uh, when the, the studies of the students progress, uh, they will see more advanced databases where they would see not just aluminum alloy, but many different specific grades for this alloy, which they can choose from. And uh, this would bring them uh, to, to the real life industry case. Also, uh, we encourage multidisciplinary approach. So, after material selection, this project can be extended uh, to um, export the material properties and continue with design and simulation. And uh, the, the three key things to take out here is that uh, this software, uh, this tool is um, uh, developed for specifically for academia. It is used across engineering courses by academics worldwide and uh, it is aimed at preparing students for their future careers in research and industry and this is why it shares the same interface as uh, Granta selector tools. So we have already been through uh, materials data, through materials selection and uh, now it's time to go to materials data management. If I have to summarize the top five challenges that companies with uh, no material data management tool are facing, this would be that uh, a lot of time, effort and uh, design iterations are wasted because incorrect materials data is used. Uh, the next big challenge is uh, the testing. As you know, this can be a huge expense, especially if we are talking about uh, properties such as fatigue, for example. And if we don't have such uh, um, materials data management tool to, to capture all of the tests that have been previously performed and uh, to, to assure visibility to all of the people in the company what tests have been made, then there is a great risk of repeated material testing, which uh, costs a fortune. The, the third big challenge is that time is wasted searching and analyzing materials data enterprise wide. Very often uh, people don't have visibility of all of the materials data that is inside the company. They might have information, for example, only from their department. And it is a wide known fact that materials are the second largest expense for many engineering businesses. So even a small reduction in this uh, cost can lead to a huge increase in revenue. 
and uh, risk over material compliance with uh, global regulations is also important. Uh, companies need to keep track of uh, what uh, are their products made of, if they contain some uh, restricted chemicals, some restricted substances, and also keep track uh, uh, of these for products that they have made in the past and keep track of all of the different regulations in all of different regions around the world. These challenges uh, come because usually because there is no centralized data management system and uh, usually the materials information that companies possess can be uh, spread in different silos of information, spread across different departments in many different formats. Some of it may be outdated and uh, there is no consistency or traceability whatsoever. The solution of Granta is a centralized gold source of materials data. This is uh, this uh, corporate materials information and uh, the MI management system in the center. And uh, each and every person in the company that is somehow related to materials can uh, benefit and can use this uh, information. Starting from the data feeders, the people that are inputting data into the system, from the testing department, materials engineering and materials experts, and going through all of the data users, which can be simulation, product design and development, manufacturing, and so on. Um, it is also important that um, a Granta keeps an integration with different corporate systems, PLM, uh, CAD, CA and ERP tools. And a great benefit here is for uh, each of these users. They are uh, either specialized applications in Grant MI, as you see here for materials engineering and environment and regulatory, or uh, there is an integration into the working environment, for example, for simulation and product design. Uh, what exactly is this uh, data management system, what it uh, consists of? The first thing users can benefit from this, uh, from the grant reference material libraries, which uh, are, which contain validated and reliable data. But what is more important alongside those, they can store and uh, capture their proprietary materials information. And uh, for each step of the uh, life cycle of the of the product, of its uh, design life cycle, we look at the materials information from a different perspective. As you see here, um, aesthetic and rendering, basic material properties, then in the simulation, detailed engineering properties, um, supplier spec, compliance data, and so on. And all of this information can be captured within this system. Uh, but uh, this data can sometimes become very complex. So we have specialist materials data structures. And for example, uh, there are special templates that can get you very easily, for example, from your test data to, to go through your uh, design allowables. And um, a grant also provides tools to manage the materials data lifecycle. So it is not important just to, to capture the material properties, but to capture the pedigree of the data. So uh, if I get back, uh, let's say five or 10 years from now, I can go back and see what were the conditions that a certain test was performed and um, how the design allowables were derived so that I can be sure that I'm working with uh, trusted data even 10 years from now. So another great uh, benefit is this full traceability. And uh, there is also access and change control. 
some companies may not want to publish their data to uh, and to make it available to all of the users inside the company. They may want to restrict it, for example, to certain people or to certain projects, to certain sites. So there is a very easy way to achieve this inside this system. And also you can keep track of the changes that are made into your um, approved materials proprietary data. For example, the polymers, their properties may change with time or their formulation may change. So um, later on you can go back and see who made this change when it was made and uh, maybe there uh, you can leave a note why it was necessary. So the, the benefits that come with Grant IMI, uh, the first thing is that it drives efficiency by uh, reducing the time for searching for data by 70%. By 70 uh, companies get uh, higher engineering productivity and by reducing the material costs, uh, this results in millions of saving on raw material costs. It is also important to stay agile. This is why Granta keeps an, op an open ecosystem with uh, uh, integration to different tools. And uh, safeguard reputation is also important in terms of uh, securing compliance to different regulations and minimizing restricted substances risk. Also reducing the, the warranty returns and uh, the product failure. Uh, innovation is very important and uh, by reducing the, the few repeat simulations, uh, companies get their products much faster to market and uh, this gives them a great competitive advantage, especially when it comes to, to innovation. Sustainability is another big topic uh, today and uh, Grant AMI helps you um, control your products in, in this area as well. And finally, there is the, the benefit of the digital transformation with uh, keeping full traceability and uh, digital threat uh, companies can achieve engineering intelligence. On this slide, you can see a short list of the customers that are already using these material solutions. And uh, there are some uh, big companies and organizations here, but what uh, you should take out from this slide is that uh, grant solutions are used along many different industries basically every industry that is uh, producing physical products and that is related to materials. And as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, they are not also the, the industry partners, but also software partners, uh, data partners, uh, in, in this number also some uh, standard thinking institutions, they are uh, R&D and educational collaborations. And uh, a summary of the advantages that you can get from ANSYS Granta. The first uh, main one is accurate materials information leads to accurate results. And um, making simulation, Granta helps you to make simulation easier with an open ecosystem. Uh, and uh, this information is accessible within uh, different CAD, CAE and uh, PLM software. And this integration alongside uh, keeping uh, consistent and traceable data within the different departments in the company is making engineering teams much more productive. It also allows companies have deeper insights into their products by making the right trade-offs uh, between the, the performance of the product and initiatives such as saving cost, um, uh, light weighting, or for example, improving the, the product quality. 
And finally, uh, these material solutions help you transform your business, which is a foundational step to a wider engineering digital transformation. I would like to, to thank you all for your kind attention. I hope that some of this information will be valuable to your future work. Um, I'm not sure if we right now we have time for questions. Uh, Jay will help me with this, but uh, even if we don't feel free to to visit our website or to reach out to me directly or to our support email that you see here listed below, I would be happy to discuss your queries. Thank you. Thank you, Maria, for a very interesting presentation. Quick question, yeah. Yeah, please go ahead. So, uh, we, we learned two, uh, I mean, solid mechanics uh, type of talks, uh, DEM talk and your grant, uh, Maria. Uh, yes. Are they sharing same uh, material constructive models or they're totally different tracks? Uh, can you repeat which ones? So the DEM talk, it seems to be like a, um, a material material interaction type of uh, discrete uh, element uh, part, uh, method. Yeah, Ru, can I jump and uh, answer sure. your question? Sure. These are two different things. Uh, two different, okay. Yeah, so DEM is uh, dealing with the particle particle interaction, not mm. at the material level. OK, so I it's see. like, uh, yes. yeah, obviously the the way we we solve for a structural mechanics, the material comes into the picture. So okay. DEM is like a discrete element method to solve two particle particle interaction or it can be multiple particle interaction. Whereas okay. this Maria is talking about how we can select the material. Uh, uh, for for different things, you know, so this is more on the material intelligence. I see, I see. Not, yeah, not the solver. Okay, thank you.